Role playing can come in a variety of different forms. The old school pen and paper with dice acting out in various dress costumes. But interestingly enough, it doesn't really require being social. And that's kind of where RPG games come in. While World of Warcraft is social, arguably the earlier versions more so than its current form, it was definitely designed around RPG elements. How much you RP is really entirely up to you. So in this particular choice today, we're going to go ahead and look at the Forsaken in World of Warcraft and their starting zone, Death Nip. I think it's best to get an idea of my initial thoughts of this playable race. It seems pretty fair to say I've always enjoyed playing this campy character in any game genre that I can. We're going to dissect what those quests are like, the musical score, and also the overall tone to the area. We take a look at what went into its structure and eventually lead to what elements they actually did that was the best. Either way, what we have in the end is a look back at this classic vanilla zone before expansion changes were done, I think it's best to always start from there. With all that being said, remember if you like this style of content to go ahead and give a thumbs up and subscribe, but we're going to go ahead and dive in. <laughs> Bound to the iron will of the tyrant Lich King, the vast undead armies of the Scourge seek to eradicate all life on Azeroth. Led by the Banshee Sylvanas Windrunner, a group of renegades broke away from the Scourge and freed themselves of the Lich King's domination. Known by some as the Forsaken, this group fights a constant battle, not only to retain its freedom from the Scourge, but also to slaughter those who would hunt them as monsters. With Sylvanas as their Banshee Queen, the Forsaken have built a dark stronghold beneath the ruins of Lordaeron's former capital city. This hidden undercity forms a sprawling labyrinth that stretches beneath the haunted woods of the Tirisfal Glades. Though the very land is cursed, the zealous humans of the Scarlet Crusade still cling to their scattered holdings, obsessed with eradicating the undead and retaking their homeland. Convinced that the primitive races of the Horde can help them achieve victory over their enemies, the Forsaken have entered an alliance of convenience. Harboring no true loyalty for their new allies, they will go to any lengths to ensure their dark plans come to fruition. As one of the Forsaken, you must massacre any who pose a threat to the new order human, undead, or otherwise. I think there are a couple key points to look at from the introduction to the undead race. The first and foremost being that they are a collective of what I would call lost souls, seeking to hold on to what they have gained. There isn't much in the beginning explaining what the Scourge is. However, there is a lot surrounding this little tidbit of info dump from the introduction. WoW was released after Warcraft RTS games and this heavily involved Warcraft 3. I think it's also interesting that they mentioned the pact made with the Horde, specifically the part of no real ties of loyalty to their arrangement. This makes it plain that the undead are only interested in one thing, themselves, which doesn't make them necessarily evil, but the lines are definitely drawn in the sand on where they stand. If anything, from future expansions, we also see this played out several times, and it is a very distinct and defying trait of the Forsaken themselves. As for the music, I have to say it really is some of my favorite of all time. Leveling in the starting area, especially at night, just vibes well with my own nostalgic memories. The atmosphere it brings is tremendous, but it is best served if we go ahead and have a listen to it.
If the music doesn't set the mood, then the starting point of the Forsaken plays out perfectly. We begin inside a crypt with only being able to go up as a starting direction. I'm hard pressed to think of a better place to begin a game than to crawl out of your own grave. Once we make it topside, we're introduced to a quest giver by the name of Undertaker Murdo. He tells us that we are freshly risen, but if it hadn't happened pretty soon, then we would have been corpse firewood. This informs us of something that harkens back to what I was saying about the Forsaking. They only concern themselves about themselves. If you aren't with them, then you're not really useful. Even then, we still see this played out in their own dialogue with one another. Each member of the undead has to be part of a cog. There's no place for the weak or the unwilling. Mordo directs us to the Shadow Priest Sarvis down the hill in their run-down chapel. While chugging down the hill, we can see the surrounding countryside. The trees are alive, but there's a darkness that hangs over the area. And the buildings ahead all look in disrepair, as if they've been there for a very very long time. It says to the player, no one living is inside. In the distance, as we approach the chapel, we can see the spiked wooden columns jutting out of the ground, a makeshift wall that definitely looks out of place of everything else. But a barrier from what? When we speak to the Shadow Priest Sarvis, the backstory begins to be filled in and harkens back to the broken introduction to answer some of the questions that have been made without elaborating. We learn that the Lich King's army is extensive. We're tasked with destroying mindless ones, which while we are forsaken, they are the fallen, slaves to the Lich King. This, however, still does not fill us in on how we are standing there and how this came to be that we're independent and through what process did this happen. It leaves a lot of unanswered questions, but at least it gives us a directive and a direction. Slay the fallen in the northern part of the village below. Inside the chapel is also another quest available, but this is because of the class of the warlock chosen. We meet Vinya Marthand, and she asks us to retrieve rattle cage skulls to learn the ability to summon our first demonic pet, the Imp. I think it's interesting that we are given such a strong power play still at level 1. Now, the quest does involve we engage with some level 3 mobs, but it is more than worth it to attain this pet early and make questing so much easier and faster in that first hour. Upon leaving the chapel, it's time to start raining destruction upon the undead in the area. I like like that the first part of this quest is really close. Actually, most of the hot spots in the initial questing zone are smack dab in the small village below the graveyard, so it's very easy to just skip a little bit lower and gather three skulls from the skeletons for that quest for the imp, and then double back and finish off the zombies above them. Also, being a warlock allows for extra quests and the XP involved with it as well, and so by the time we turn in both the starting two quests, we're already level three. Now, Shadow Priest Sarvis has two new quests to offer. One is to meet our warlock trainer, Maximilian, and the other is to go and eradicate more undead, in particular the rattle cage skeletons. Now, maybe I'm being a little bit picky, but I think that the naming of these mobs is extremely interesting. We see this played out several times in several different areas of World of Warcraft, but sometimes it would be nice to get a little backstory on why they're called rattle cage. We even see it in the last batch of quests, with the one type of zombie being named Wretched and the other Mindless. But it would have been nice to have a little lore dropped in a quest or a hint to the why of this naming convention that they've come up with. When I do finally see it done in RPG games, it really does feel rewarding. That's not to say that there aren't moments in World of Warcraft where they do just that, it's just not in this particular section. Upon meeting our warlock training and learning some new abilities, I also want to note that it's interesting in the approach given. Maximilian wants to sympathize with the player, understanding that we yearn for control of not only ourselves, but others. Of course, this information is only parlayed through a tainted scroll, which is really confounding considering Maximilian is standing just to the left of the Shadow Priest Sarvis and Sarvis said I should find Maximilian. By God, we did, didn't we? He's right there. After seeing the trainer and learning our imp ability from Vinya, we also see that there is a quest available to the right of Sarvis by an undead lady named Novus Elrith. She explains that she tends to the wounded warriors, tailors armor, and also clothes. She offers to find us armor if we do something for her. She wants us to acquire multiple paws and wings from the wolves and bats to the south. Why? I really have no clue. Whatever the case, it rewards armor and any quest that rewards the player with anything at this point is really needed. I just want to say for character building, that moment when you summon the imp as a warlock is entirely too gratifying. Also, I find it great that we don't get to name the imp and that the imp has its own name upon spawning in. It connects to the player that this is an entirely different entity of its own. After leaving the crumbling chapel to venture out once again with fresh spells, a new imp, and purpose, the next series of quests were 
fairly streamlined. In this approach going around the first building in the village below, we find ourselves knee deep in wolves and bats of a low level range. And before we know it, we're knee deep also in rattle cage skeletons on the verge of finishing the quests already given. Now this process would have been a little bit slower for any other caster class, but Warlock breezes through it fairly easy. I also want to point out that it's nice to have a small quest hub above the ruined village, complete with different types of vendors, but all streamlined in their approach. It goes a long way to relay the structure presented in the beginning, and the overall progression at this point is slow enough to allow for room to explore and see what this area has to offer. It is a unique balance that I find missing from a lot of MMOs, where they simply overwhelm the player right off the bat with too many mechanics, currencies, help guides, and simply present way too much shit to the player. Even later versions of World of Warcraft do this. Upon turning back to the quest, Elris presents us with an interesting story of her friend Marla Phipps. Marla is killed actually by her loving husband, who is now turned into a feral undead, but she truly loved him deeply and wanted to be buried by him. It's her last dying wish. What I like about this quest is it's the first time we're presented with humane side to the undead. This one quest sparks something unique in the process. There is at least a redemption to be found in the dead and maybe a purpose. There isn't much to offer in the chapel but a last quest to turn with Sarvis that rewards us for the rattle cage skeletons and then he sends us on our way. Once we leave the chapel, two quest givers are close by. First one is Death Guard Saltane, a gruff sergeant type that gives us the rookie treatment and tells us to go gather some supply boxes and he might get us something in the process, which for us is more armor. And the other quest is from Executor Aaron. Aaron wants us to help reclaim a gold mine for resources to fuel the undead but it happens to be infested with spiders, and he wants us to clear it out. Now, I always enjoy mines or caves as part of a quest. While the area would be interesting enough to explore without one, the quest given just enriches the whole process. Now, at this moment, the player is presented with two different directions to take, towards Samuel Phipps and the boxes, or towards the mine and the spiders. I think the option's pretty easy. Complete the first two quests, and then do the one by itself. Upon going down the rise of the village, we're presented with several named corpses at this junction, all beside a tent. This is also the first time we're presented with named undead, other than Forsaken, that have their own character image. While they aren't more special than the mindless zombies we've been killing as far as an NPC type, they are presented a different and I think it's a good choice since there is weight in the decision of the quest of destroying Samuel Phipps and burying his body next to his wife now the grave is conveniently back up the rise and we have to go through the ruined village to get there making the pickup of the boxes easy to get and allow us to turn in two quests at once is a quick jolt of quest XP that helps to strengthen our character before encountering the spiders which is the first to ramp up in difficulty I'm a fan of slightly difficult content being trickled to you slowly. The world as we explore should be a dangerous place, and the more we explore, the more dangers we encounter. The spiders in the mine are of the aggro variety, even though later on they would change this to not being aggro. It's the first time we're presented with mobs of really any real challenge. Also, I find it that it's worth exploring the back of the caves or mines, as always, because usually there's a chest to be rewarded. Once back to the hub, we are presented with a new quest in a new direction. This pulls all the way back to the beginning introduction when we were told about the Scarless Crusade. Now we're told that just over the rise there's an encampment that's been set up by a group of individuals. It is also the first time we're presented with options to confront them. For proof of the deeds against the Crusade, we're to bring back 12 armbands from the Scarlet Crusaders. I like this because it builds more on world lore. An encounter with another group early says that there is more to the world than just random NPCs and monsters. It is a way to connect the player to their faction and give it an identity. Also, this is our first weapon reward. And for some, a really good incentive to continue forward. While the quest is just another kill certain number of and collect, the idea of what we were doing is presented well enough. Also, I like how this is set out in the open. It's a good place to learn positioning amongst roaming mobs and pack pulling. It presents some of the core functions that you need to learn to progress in World of Warcraft successfully. After completing the quest, we're giving another to confront the Messenger of the Scarlet Crusade. Now, we saw the name figure in our grind for the arm beds just in the quest earlier, and if anything, we know where his location is, back at that camp. Now, if we're quick enough, the mobs won't evolve respawn in this particular instance as well. We're able to deliver the Coupe de Gras quickly to the messenger and turn in the quest with the documents on hand. One thing of note here is the reward. It's another sizable reward for certain classes. I really like that there's two quests back to back with ramped up rewards given in this area. It's also good because we gather intel on our enemy, a map. This culmination of events unfolds where we've cleared the mindless undead, given supplies to our masters, cleared a mine, and now we've taken the fight back to the Scarlet Crusade. It is really a great wrapping point to the storyline in this area. 
Also, the map is of such importance, we're informed to travel on to the township of Brill, where we're to meet another superior by the name of Executor Zygan. Our time in Death Mill has come to a close, but it opens up so much more of the area as we leave, and we also leave with a purpose and a mission. A grasp of what we're doing and also a little experience under our belt and what we're going to encounter in this world. Overall, one of the better starting areas presented in any RPG game ever. With that, we're going to go ahead and close off this retrospective of the starting area of World of Warcraft. Remember to hit that bell for more notifications for future videos. This is Dungeon J signing out. Have a great day gaming. Later. I'm just walking the line and there's nobody with me.